For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Donovan. Uh, I'm an Ames resident, though I'm an immigrant to your town. I actually grew up in the neighboring community of Boone, Iowa. Um, I like to think about my, and what I do for a living, by the way, is besides finishing up my long suffering doctoral program at Iowa State University, the good graces of my department and the university, we're at the 20 year mark. <laughs> In my defense, there's a couple of MAs between here and there, so. Um, what I do for a living is I actually am the chief archaeologist and historian for the Iowa Department of Transportation. People ask the question, why does the Iowa Department of Transportation need an archaeologist or a historian? We try to do our best not to put the highway through the burial mounds, through his prehistoric villages, through barns. Let me do something right now. So far, we've avoided that. Um, yesterday, while having coffee with a friend, okay, having a beer with a friend of mine, <laughs> We started talking about, again, both being immigrants to your community. Uh, what was something that was familiar to us? I had grown up in Boone. He had grown up in Nebraska. And that was the railroads. Oftentimes, as the conversation moved forward, we take them for granted. They're something that we see every day. And I have, and I'll talk about this towards the end of the lecture, a fairly strong heritage with railroads. It's what brought my family to Iowa. I think it's interesting how we look at railroads and think to ourselves, well, they're there. We hear the Union Pacific roar through town. And for some of us who can remember back that, we hear the Chicago Northwestern roll through town. But oftentimes we find them annoying. Many of us have been cut off between north and south, and we've had to wait for trains. Uh, right here, I have cursed out the railroads, <laughs> waiting to get across to the Department of Transportation, which in its own way is kind of a weird cycle. But yet it makes our history and our community. That because, to be honest, as I'll talk about as we look at this, there is no Ames without railroads. Uh, I think this is a very interesting photo, stolen <laughs> off of Google on the internet. If you look in the back, you'll see two trains. Of course, what's unique? It's a steam engine. But what's on the, Ch the Chicago Northwestern track? A freight train and passenger train. It's very, very rare to see that now on our route. Uh, anyone know where this location is? You Ames historical people, it comes off of your side. That's right, exactly. I think it's a good example of showing the relationship between the community and the railroad as the railroad moves forward and settles in. Um, I like to think about something. A number of 19th century historians, by the way, I'm getting ready for field exams in September, so I read a lot about 19th century historians, talk about there's two times in American history in the 19th century. There is the time before the railroad came, and there is the time after the railroad came. And in our case, after the railroad was Ames, Iowa. A clue to our story, uh, I forgot to bring my laser pointer. What is that? That is a water tower and a railroad track. Why does Ames become Ames? Water. Water, exactly. <clears throat> Who is this individual? Amesians? Yeah. Oh, Ames. Why would a senator from the east have a town named after him along a rail route. He was a friend of Blair's. He was a friend of Blair's, and he was an investor in railroads. <laughs> there was a time in this country, believe it or not, where corruption, perhaps, patronage, mm -hmm, was a little bit more tolerated. If you, for example, were a major investor in an industry, and yet you also control major influence on the policy of the country in developing the industry, it was okay. Years later, um, and again, Oaks Ames deserves his, his own lecture. I hope someday I've actually had individuals who know a great deal about him. We'll talk about he'll spend the rest of his life dealing with that concept of scandal. Towards the end of his life, he writes consistently, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> now, there's another statue of it. And it makes sense in many ways as we look through the history of a town and looking towards, well, why the town is named who it is, 
we want to find out why the town came to be, and John Blair is critical of this. John Blair was born in 1802 and passed away in 1899. He was, very much his life, spanned at the 19th century. He was born in New Jersey to Scottish immigrants. And at one point in his life, they asked Mr. Blair, who didn't graduate past what we call fifth grade, why he didn't pursue an education. And he said, well, I have a family of about seven people, seven siblings. And there was enough education, I thought, spent on them that I decided that I would decide instead become rich. <laughs> Blair was very much, perhaps, the product. And I would oftentimes say an example of being industrious. He was someone who, as a youth, would catch rabbits, skin them, and sell their pelts. I think it's 16 for 16 cents. And he built up a small fortune. And then he worked for a retail company, a merchant. And then he bought the merchant store. And then he bought another merchant store. And then he expanded. And he kept expanding. And he learned the power of political patronage. He bought into coal. He bought into rail. And he, in many ways, was becoming sort of the example of, well, we oftentimes call them robber barons in the 21st century. But the truth is, Blair was very charitable. He built towns. I think this is interesting. This is Blair's town, Iowa. Have any of you ever been there? It's over in Benton County. It's, of course, along what? The railroad. This is Blair's town, New Jersey. Named after Blair. It's built along the railroad. Blair became, because of his, his interests in industry, it was only a matter of time before he became involved in railroad construction. There was a historian that once said, again, all those 19th century historians I'm reading right now, that had England not come up with the steam engine, the railroad, we would have, because it was perfectly well set for the Americans. I think it's interesting, one of the things about Blair is that as he builds things, he, as he builds railroads, he builds communities. Many of us are homeowners, I hope, I know, I, I, I paid my mortgage today online. Um, we are oftentimes, in our own way, land speculators because we buy into our house. We improve our house. At some point, if my wife and I ever decide to sell our house, which after 30 years it looks like I'm not quite sure when to leave after that, and that much suffering. Um, one of the ideas is we speculate to increase value. Blair saw this, particularly into the West. What we'll talk about today, too, is an individual named W.W. W. Walker, who will settle in Cedar Rapids. <coughs> Walker is a civil engineer. What would the relationship be between a man who's an industrialist, a wealthy individual, an investor, and getting a civil engineer on board? I think this is an interesting photograph. This is actually from the web, and this is the first locomotive in Iowa. Because in the 1850s, it was railroad mad Iowa. Iowa is settling in, and it's also a perfect place to put railroads. Because of this, let's stop for a moment. I, I like to do this sometimes when I lecture with students. In, in DOT work, we talk about these various views the 5,000 foot view, the 10,000 foot view, looking down on something. Same happens in history. So if we stop for a moment and start talking about the 1850s in the United States, what is one of the major issues that's going on now? What is the debate? Slavery. Slavery. Iowa is a free state. Texas is a slave state. The route to the Pacific. And you have in Congress, we think we have issues about debates. We think we have issues about arguments. There is a solid argument going on about, we're not going to let you build a road, excuse me, a railroad through Texas, through New Mexico to California, because it will expand slavery. We're not going to let you build a road through Illinois into Iowa, into Nebraska, because it expands free states. So you have this debate rolling ahead. But as they're prepping, as Iowa opens up, it becomes full of this idea of building railroads. Um, 
This is a very good. <clears throat> the first railroads to be built in Iowa are on the Mississippi River. Before the coming of the railroads, what was the major transportation routes? The rivers. Uh, the DOT has got an excellent online exhibits of what roads look like. And you'll see getting out of the mud, which a couple of presentations have been made, and they do excellent work on this. We'll show the roadways. Well, imagine them in the 1850s. Wagon routes, they're a little more than trails. But it's the rivers that are critical. And as part of that, of course, we have the Missouri River, excuse me, the Missouri River we want to reach, and the Mississippi River. And these are building up railroad systems because the idea of bringing what into town is the river commerce, agricultural products. But at the same time, I want to say something the Iowa DOT would like you to know right now. I am not an engineer. <laughs> they will remind you that now. Don't ask man engineering questions. Just, he'll, he'll make up something. Um, Iowa is good for building railroads. What are we lacking that stops them? Mountains. Now we do have our bumps. We have our valleys. But for the most part, and I'm saying we're a flat state, we're a state that's concurrent to the building of railroad systems. So as we approach Railroad Mad Iowa in the 1850s, our friend Blair comes to Iowa. And he comes because of an invite from his friend, Abraham Lincoln. He attended the National Convention of the Republican Party, and he decided to go on a sightseeing trip to see Iowa. And when he came to Iowa, they said, there was no perfect man that could take on the challenge and the money of going after and creating these routes. Iowa also, have you heard, go west, young man. It's not about Montana. It's not about California. It's actually written about Iowa City because it's the gateway to the west. And in the 1850s, there are a number of people that say, this is the gateway to the West, because you can run this route to one central location, and that is Council Bluffs. Remember Abraham Lincoln visited Council Bluffs at one point with his friend, who we'll know as General Dodge, and talking about the building of a railroad. Blair shows up at the age of 62 and starts the process of taking over railroads, or starts the process of building a railroad. I like to show this. This is the Iowa Rail Land Company. If you're going to build railroads, if you're going to invest in railroads, what three things should you have controlling interest in? Buying the land, building the railroad, running the railroad. Blair shows up and makes it a point to get controlling interests over as many of the rail companies as he can, particularly the route through the central part of the state, which we know now as the Union Pacific Line, which at the time, was known as the Cedar Rapids Missouri River Railroad Company. And if you look, who is that? That's John Blair. He's guaranteeing your investment. This is actually a part of the, these are actually, this is a, a photograph from Davenport, Iowa, in the process of building the, building the railroad. There are a couple of things where maybe it was luck, or maybe it wasn't. That when Blair shows up in Iowa, he needs a couple of things. He needs material, ties, rail. He also needs a good civil engineer. We just met Walker. He also needs labor. I have a friend of mine named Chad Hauser who I hope one day will come talk to you. And he'll tell you about the great Ponzi schemes of creating a railroad company. I'm not giving you guys any ideas, but it's masterful in the idea that you have to have investors. And oftentimes you're selling to investors that have never seen Iowa. They have never actually, in some cases, they have not been in the United States. You see where you're getting this money to build rail, and you need this profit. Something happens. When everything is getting engaged up, imagine those staging ideas. In Clinton, Iowa, there's a rail company. And all of a sudden, somebody out east takes all the money and runs. What does he leave behind in Clinton, Iowa? 2,000 Irish immigrant laborers who had showed up to work on the railroad. And then 
John Blair shows up and says, well, there's my labor force. And starts the process because he comes in to save the railroad. Or he comes in to buy out the shares of the railroad. Railroads and building railroads is a busy and hard process, particularly in this period of time. You have to build a grade. Again, this claim from the Iowa DOT, Matt is not allowed to build grades. Okay? But the idea is, again, to put a place to put tracks upon. This is actually a picture from the American Civil War. And of course, again, you have to build structure and infrastructure. In this case, the idea is developing a route. Now, we're in the 1850s, but we're heading in the 1860s. Blair shows up here, and in 62, he gets the railroad built to Cedar Rapids. And then, after 62, he makes the push to the west. And that's where you have towns like Blairsburg to pop up. But also, as we've talked about, what do steam engines need? They need coal, and they need water. And as you're moving along this route, you also have encouragement by the federal government to give you grants, grants to build railroads. We'll give you a bunch of land. You can buy cheap from us. Blair's all about buying cheap. Blair purchases land, and as he's moving forward, he begins creating communities. And he creates, of course, our city of Ames by creating a water stop. I like these kind of pictures because it talks about the idea of just the labor involved with this. Uh, again, this is actually railroad building in the Civil War. But there's also <coughs> the question, too, how do you make money off the railroad? I think it's a good point to stop for a second. Again, let's talk about the 1860s. It is obvious what's going on in the country, or countries. We have the American Civil War going on. And as you're building rail, how do troops get to Keokuk, our jump point? Wagon, walk, river. So as you're building along these rail systems, you have a lot of support from the federal government to also improve the rail system, the idea of mobilizing troops. I think this is an interesting photo. Of course, it shows a steam engine from about the period. It shows a dog. Who's this individual? My answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was just a unique photograph. Uh, one of the things I, I do, by the way, at Iowa State University, we talk about what is Matt specializing. In the world of academics, we have brands. And I know the Donovan brand is, is uh, weak. But the point is that we talk about, I like to talk about public history. And when I talk to the public about history, I, ask, I like to ask those questions, who do you think that is? Because honestly, I don't know. And I think it's... It's an interesting representation. It could be Lincoln. It could be a Civil War photo of Lincoln. This is actually in Kansas. And I like the idea that it shows, well, again, the creation of rail systems. So you can imagine in 62, we start crossing into this part of the country. We start building grades. We start building bridges. We start heading towards council blocks. I like this photo especially. The idea is where this is at. Let us know, there are trees. And it's a good example of laying track, laying down ties. This is Alaska in 1913. I like to show that idea because there's two things. I think it's a great photo showing railroad building, but it's also showing railroad building as it's moving consistently west and creating the links of the new frontier or the old frontier. This is, I think, is a, this is actually from the University of Northern Iowa website, and it talks about early railroad routes in Iowa. We're talking, of course, Northwestern. Lyons and Clinton, the Council Bluffs. Something to keep in mind when Blair enters this game with <coughs> Walker. This is a race. Because you want to do what first? You want to reach Council Bluffs because you've created your route. If you create that route, you get the most freight across it, the most passengers. Now, a little bit later when we get into Nebraska and then the expansion to the west, as a number of you, by the way, are, are probably great railroad historians, and hopefully I'm not insulting you, I might have lacked some of this knowledge. As you go forward into the west, railroad building is more about getting that track in place. Now, maybe that track moves when the train goes across it. 
and maybe it kind of wobbles a little bit after the train goes over it. We'll get back to it because you're also dealing with a race and the competition that's set up. In Iowa, the game is to get the Council Bluffs, eventually, of course, to Sioux City. Blair is very capable of this race. Um, one of the elements that I, I'd like to talk about, too, with the creation of railroads is that as we think about the development of transportation systems, and we have our character John Blair who's out there. Blair is an all-encompassing one-stop monopoly. He goes out with John W.W. W. Walker, and they begin talking to the public. Because this is actually a great example of John Blair in action. He's 62 years old. He brings along his base of command is a rail car pulled by a steam engine. And as he approaches these communities, him and himself, Blair and Walker, they both are grand, very personal people. They meet with communities. We can imagine being farmers here in Central Iowa, here where the city of Ames is, and he would meet with us. We meet in some sort of location, whether it's a town hall or a courthouse. And we talk about what the railroad will mean to you and what you can do for the railroad. I, just, I showed you a while back an investment certificate showing John Blair who's guaranteed. I would like you, the citizens of the future community of Ames, or the community of Nevada, or as we'll talk about in a little bit, the community of Boone, to provide money. Make an investment. I will bring your railroad through your town. Now, that's an interesting sell, isn't it? Because you're thinking, well, hold a second, you know, you're going to show up here, shouldn't you be giving me money? Oh no, I own this land. Check your parcels. Um, I'd like to get to this point. This is actually a misgiver. Because the original courthouse in Boone County, Boonesboro, burnt down before this. This is a great story about John Blair and W.W. W. Walker. And even though it's not in Story County, I think it's probably what we could imagine that our two individuals, maybe with a good vision, conducted. Alfonso Barkley is Alfonso Barclay was a 19th century historian from Boone County. He's actually a Civil War veteran. And he writes a story that you can actually find online. I'd like you all to take a look if you'd like, about how Boonesboro lost the railroad station. This story goes like this. Blair and Walker go to the courthouse of Boonesboro, which is now West Boone. And they have a conversation just like I would have had if I was one of the citizens of Story County. We're going to bring a railroad, and we're willing to bring you that station to Boonesboro. We're willing to do this, but are you willing to give us money to do that? We should invest together. I'm willing to bring this to you and bring commerce, because the railroads are equally mine. <coughs> citizens of Boone have this meeting. Now, there's tea and cake served. There's also coat racks. On one of the coat racks is the coat, long coat, of W.W. W. Walker. And in that coat is a roll of paper. It is the map of where the railroad is going to go. Blair and Walker are having the conversation. They're making the sales pitch. And Walker notices they all go for cake, they all go for tea, comes back, that roll is missing. Blair and Walker cut their meeting short, and they hightail it to Des Moines. Why? The next day, they purchased a bunch of land in a place called Montana, Iowa. Any idea where Montana, Iowa is? It's, it's Boone. They are going to run the railroad and set establish the station in their town of Montana. Uh, the story goes, by the way, the name of Montana was the individuals that were now going to be investing in this part of Boone County, in the town, had a meeting to talk about names. There were various immigrants there, Irish, English, Swede, <coughs> family names, and Blair accordingly said, well, you know, yeah, this is in 65. I'm sorry, I should step back. I, I keep forgetting to mention time frames, and I'm sure I'll do well in the field exams this way, but when is Ames established? It's in 64. Next year we'll be establishing our 150th anniversary. Boom, we'll follow us in 65. The rail is being built. It's heading right into Boone County. 
and they're having this meeting. And the discussion is, why well, I want to name it New Dublin, or I want to name it, you know, Manchester, or I want to name it after mine at Jacobson City. And finally everyone gets together, well, I had a relative that was off the Montana territory, and they all look and fine. So Montana, Iowa it is. Years later, our friend Barkley, our historian, Civil War veteran Boone County, gets to have an anonymous meeting with the guy who took the map. And he talks about it. He says, okay, what was that about? He said, well, there was an investor named a wealthy citizen and I, and they had an agreement that we're going to find out that map, and we're going to buy some land. And actually, they were ready to go get on the horse and get to Des Moines to make the grant. We opened up the map. Blair and Walker had never an intention of putting it in Brunsburg. They just wanted to see what money they could possibly write up. Because the geography said that if you're going to build this railroad system, and this is before the Cape Shelley High Bridge, we're going to roll it down to the Mongona. But if we arch out, we have a better bet. So we can put it across. And it was also that conversation. Did Blair hoodwink everyone? Did he have a meeting with Walker just to say, we can put it through your town if you want to give us some money? if you'd like to buy some certificates. <laughs> Iowa, after this period of time, the rush goes on to count to, uh, excuse me, the council blocks. <clears throat> and it creates the establishment. Blair gets there first. He builds the route. And he creates the Chicago Northwestern. Well, excuse me. He will eventually sell out his shares in the creating of the Northwestern and then the Chicago Northwestern. Blair returns to the East. He ends up at the end of the 19th century one of the wealthiest men in the country. But Blair is an interesting fellow. He is a, a high <coughs> Presbyterian. He believes in charity. He donates land. He also donates money. Uh, if any of you have been to Grinnell College, J.B. Grinnell was a good friend of John Blair's. Why is Grinnell where it's at? Because he asked, where are you going to put that other railroad at, John? And he said, I'll put it here for you, J.B., and I'll give you some money to go here. And the idea of helping and that's what Blair will do. He'll give a number of large amounts of money to various charitable organizations towards the end of his life. He believed in that. Um, I think it's interesting to step back and ask yourself, well, what happens to W. David Walker? He's a successful civil engineer. He returns to Cedar Rapids. Our friend Barkley actually goes and talks to his family. And he said that, well, you know, John Blair was a character, but my dad always kind of liked him. And so and it gave him the opportunity to build these railroad systems. And then, of course, as we get to Council Bluffs, where is the railroad going from there? And it's the gateway to the West. Um, I, am a, I have heritage when it involves the railroad. My grandfather, Frank Donovan, worked in the Chicago Northwestern as a steam engineer before the First World War and after the First World War up until the 1960s when he retired. His father before then had a skill set too, and that was destroying railroads in Georgia for General Kilpatrick and General Sherman. Um, as we get older, we fade in our memory. And my grandfather would, and we would talk about as you get older, what lights up your eyes. And his eyes would lighten up when he heard an engine. Because he was a captain of the steam on the Sea of Steel. And I think that sometimes you need to remember that when we're looking at railroads. Um, when we see that train that cuts us off, maybe we close our eyes and listen to the rail. Because very much, it's so much part of our and I think it's important for us to remember, too, that it, if you see trains moving, if they're moving through your town, it shows you the country's work. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, please ask. I will attempt to find answers or make some up for you. So. <laughs> Military strategy, you know, building railroads to move troops continued, of course, into our modern era, too. So. Right. Um, the idea of, of rail building in, um, and during the Civil War time especially was the idea of controlling and moving troops. There are, there are historians that will talk to you that the North had an established system so it could move troops back and forth. Um, you know, I, I've joked about that James Donovan, who's my great grandfather, and let's keep that longevity going, by the way. Um, was a Civil War Union soldier from Illinois, and he was part of a couple of regiments that did that. They destroyed rail, and the idea was disrupting service. 
In the 1860s, I always think it's interesting in how the country is still in the grips of the Civil War, but willing to invest in building railroads and sending people, like which we'll see, General Dodge, who will go out to the West, but also the idea where Blair comes on board and is supported by the government, by people like Ames, to keep building railroads and establish Iowa. Um, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And again, out there, I'm sure there are railroad historians who will give you some great information. Everything, again, as I joked about the Ponzi schemes that of building a railroad. But it's, it's an endeavor, and it's a race. It's a competition. Uh, Stephen Ambrose, who wrote about railroad history, said, this is an example of, of American industry because we create a competition to go across the country. And we have routes to go. As railroads are building, being built here towards the west, they're building, being, going towards the east from California. The idea of linking up the country is an expansionist idea. And rail is, is an interesting business. We, we become connected. We all know why we have standard time. These are ideas of clocks, of how the railroad influenced our culture. Um, you know, I, I grew up, in, again, in Boone County, and so I, I had the pleasure of, when I was very little, going to the Chicago Western Yard and seeing steam engines, two or three. They were actually weren't going to be cut up, they were going off to museum, but they were on beds on their way out. But there were boxcars there from this kind of era, and it was just the idea of how the rail was moving along. Railroads will have tough times. Uh, they will have financial crises. They will, as we've seen in our time, where there's been the need to invest and government assistance to keep them going. Uh, I, I think it's interesting right now, in, in my life as a devotee, I joke as an archaeologist. Uh, one of the jokes I always put the point is that, you know, if you ask me historical questions, I'll say I'm an archaeologist, and you ask me history questions, I'll say, well, you know, um, I'm an archaeologist as well. I, I try to sit on the fancy, that makes me probably a good bureaucrat. Uh, the point is that, you know, we're getting into kind of the redevelopment of rail in Iowa. We're talking about rail systems that link up Chicago to Iowa City. Uh, if you've seen the Rail of Trails project, of course you've seen it. It's where you, you go out and look at these old road beds. Uh, we face a challenge, particularly with our ethanol industry moving forward, where those old routes would have probably come in handy to move ethanol. And so we have the process of rebuilding rail. Uh, it's not as cheap as it once was, certainly, but it's something that we're seeing now. Uh, as an archaeologist, I, I look towards what do rail beds mean as archaeological sites. What do they tell me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about the building of a railroad? I can see if we were to dig in to the Union Pacific Rail, which they'd rather us not, we will see levels almost of where the grades were constructed and built upon themselves. And every once in a while, you'll find unique things. You know? you'll find rail yards that have been forgotten. Uh, I actually have a friend of mine who studies uh, the hobos, the idea of the travelers of the rail, and following their camps and looking at them at archaeological sites and finding those historic elements. You know, what do you find? Uh, again, it's all fascinating history, and we're lucky to have some great historians out there that have written about it. We also have, you know, the internet and the web, which we have a great number of great avocational and professional historians, everyday citizens that are putting up information. You can Google and find great photographs. You can Google and find stories about this stuff in John Blair that I haven't even touched. A quick conclusion. Why did I start talking about John Blair? Maybe I should have kept quiet at Ames Historical Society for me. <laughs> but uh, we have a painting of John Blair. And the question was, well, who's John Blair? Why would Ames, Iowa? And I, you know, wasn't really, you know, I was taking some notes, and I started talking about it. I said, well, yeah, we have John Blair because this reason, and this reason, and this reason. And then I heard in the back, that would make a great lecture. So, um, either you can blame them, or blame me for not being quiet. Uh, but, in any case, thank you very much, and take care. And he mentioned the painting of John Blair, and this painting hung in the Ames Public Library for many, many, many years in Farwell. That was one of Farwell's great quests, was to find the portrait of John Blair. And, and he did find it down in Des Moines, and somehow arm-twisted the people who owned it at that time until letting it loose on a long, long, long-term loan up to Ames. And the people who agreed to that long, long-term loan have completely forgotten, and they don't care if it ever comes back. So we are the happy owners of a very beautiful portrait of John Blair. 
and we, we hope to have that restored in the next couple of years. Um, but it is now in our possession and in our collection, a bit in storage at the moment, but we are very pleased to have it. Again, reminding you, a couple of lectures coming up. If you need the flyer, it's over on the table inside the door. And your next job, folks, is to try to clean up everything on the table in the back of the room. So uh, thank you so much for coming today.